you know, I want to, again, um, shift the focus of the conversation. And I'm gonna, I'm hoping that we can all reintroduce ourselves using our preferred pronouns. Um, and the, the reason I wanna shift the conversation now is, I think that there's a, a huge movement for the people in the, uh, across the, the spectrum to have proper pronoun usage, to have, you know, identities being respected in all forms, communication, you know, general society, et cetera. Um, I'm very less militant about that idea than a lot of my counterparts. I think that we're in a learning, you know, we're in a huge learning curve. If you think about where we were 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 30 years ago, and, and 45, 50, when I was talking about, you know, bartenders getting arrested for serving, um, I think we're in a huge learning curve. And, and as it becomes more okay for our own personal identifications to be expressed without judgment, without hatred, and as you guys are pointing out, it's, it's not as open as, as I thought it might be um in the younger generation it's just I, I'm, I'm getting the feeling that it's it's not okay across the spectrum but it hasn't been eradicated um but i think that we need to have tolerance for persons who don't understand pronouns and don't understand identities and unfortunately you know i'm blind also uh i lost my sight five years ago and one of the things that they teach you when you you know when you're going for services especially if you're going for a guide dog is that you're you know you're a walking education platform and it was like i, I remember sitting there during that lecture and thinking to myself oh you've got to be kidding me i have been the walking platform for lgbtq for almost 20 years now now i gotta be a walking platform for blind people too Oh, heck no. And I use the other one. Um, <laughs> I do think that, you know, we need to educate as much as possible, but we also need to be very tolerant that, you know, they and queer questioning and ambivalence and, you know, gender fluidity and all of these terminologies are things that, that are not part of the mainstream as of yet. And the only way the only way to to get to a place where they're every day like lesbian, gay, and bisexual is is to educate. Um, so let me reintroduce introduce myself. I am devastatingly gorgeous Anthony Corona, and I identify as he, him, as far as my pronouns are concerned. Although every once in a while there's a little twist. I think every gay man will tell you that every once in a while he camps it up in his inner, you know, his inner Charlotte or whatever her name is will come out. You know, and the girl will go flying, but that's me. Um, let's go back there. <laughs> How about you? And your thoughts on what I just said while you introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm, I'm Nezreen, and I identify myself with she, her. I consider myself, if I can say this, cisgender female. Absolutely. And, and I, I, I was never, I was not sure about this pronoun stuff. And so I had to do some research in it. I've had to honestly ask some of these interns about their thoughts about it. I even talked to my daughter yesterday. I had a day off yesterday and I was hanging out with friends and I was telling them about this recording today and they were so excited and they were, they were sort of giving me information and educating me in their and I asked them about their views about you know, pronouns. And so I got a little bit of education through them too about it because I'd never heard of these terms before. When I grew up, we didn't use these things. Like he, she, her, all of that was part of our language and phonics, et cetera, et cetera. Although I will say he, he she, her, and him are also part of the recruiting and sourcing industry as far as looking at people profiles and, <laughs> and using search yes. engines and stuff. So there is that yeah. side to the, the pronouns as well. But honestly, I can honestly say that about myself today after doing some education because I've never heard about this. And I'm also seeing this as a recruiter, a certified recruiter. I'm also seeing these pronouns now being, um, I guess, just readily used up on LinkedIn in, in the headlines uh, of yeah. people. So this is new. It's new to me. Uh, I'm, I'm learning to understand it and uh, accept it. So that's me. <laughs> Hi. Hi, I'm Stephanie McCoy. I use she, her pronouns. I also am a cisgendered female. I was... Um, about the pronouns, um, 
similar to uh, LGBTQ uh, in my early days where I, I didn't understand it because it's not my story. I didn't understand pronouns or the use of pronouns, but I'm learning. And I think that's the beauty of it. Uh, you know, allowing, when we allow ourselves to be open and learning new things and, and just I get excited about this kind of stuff, quite honestly, <laughs> because no, do do because here was my thing with with the pronouns, like um, people who identify as they, um, they them. I didn't understand how that was used, but now that um, I have met people who identify as such, it just comes more naturally. And I think that is part of the being open to um, just new ways of thinking, new ways of understanding, and just um, being excited about being a part of, of just what's happening now in our world. I'm, I'm really excited about it. So thank you so much, Anthony, for um, thank you. Know, you moderating this conversation and for giving us um, more education on this topic. I greatly appreciate the work that you do. Thank you. As Thank do you. I. I love the insights and just opening up the space to speak because I don't think it's really talked about, Anthony, at all, whether we're blind, whether we're not. It's just not talked about at all. Much. Well, that's that's going to lead into my last question. So hold that thought. And and before the interns introduce themselves, I just want to tell you another funny story. I, I was at an LGBTQ, uh, I guess you could call it rally sit in, and um, we were going around, and of course everybody was asked to to identify themselves using pronouns. And we got to a very interesting character who um, identified themselves as balloon. Um, as and what? Funny, what? As what? balloon. They're, they're balloon. They identify as balloon. Um, some days they're filled and they're happy and they're flying in the air and, and they, you know, they, they feel full of love and knowledge. And some days they're, for lack of a better word of putting it, flaccid, um, you know, and they feel like they'll never be filled. And, I you know, that. I honestly, for a moment thinking to myself, oh God, if I've got to add the B to the tagline, it's going to be LGB. R S T U and another B, which B are you? You know, but um, I, I think it's I think it's amazing and wonderful that people that people are open enough, and I don't think enough of us are, but people are open enough to say, you know what, I I don't feel masculine, feminine, I, I feel balloon. God bless, feel a balloon and want to get felt. Uh, let's go to uh, Ryan. <laughs> Well, my name is Ryan Maxwell. Um, I'm a cis man. I do go by he, him, but I am totally fine be with being called girl, similarly to, similar to Anthony. I'm, I'm great with being called queen, okay, king. Um, sometimes I do appreciate if someone says she to me, like if they're gassing me up or giving me a compliment, you know, I, I'm fine with all of that. <laughs> <laughs> Martha? Hi. Uh, yeah, my name is Marta DeVito. I'm a proud female, and my pronouns are she and her. All right, and um, Christine. Christine, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Christine, are you um, a boy? <laughs> I wish. That sounds kind of fun, actually. <laughs> it does. It does. <laughs> um, so I'm Christine Barossi. I go by she, her. I am a cisgender, heterosexual woman. So <laughs> take from that what you So um, I kind of want to talk about something because I think it was Ryan who said that he didn't really understand like the whole cis thing. Uh, cisgender just means that your gender identity matches your sexual assignment at birth. Mm -hmm. So I am comfortable being a woman. I've always been a woman. I've never really felt like I needed to be anyone else. Um, you know, so that's what cisgender means. And that's how I've always been. 
But now you're thinking about maybe identifying as balloon. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all are. Maybe for a day. <laughs> Just give it a try it out. Love and knowledge every day. Think about it. To start off as this tiny little string of something, and by the end of the day, with the love and the knowledge you get, you're floating in the stratosphere. And you're I, I, I love the idea that somebody wants to live their life that way every day. That, that just makes wow. me very happy. Yeah. Mm. Um, so the last topic that I wanted to segue into, it's a two pronged um, topic and, and I think we can go backwards again from Ryan and then up to us, um, quote unquote, uh, seasoned folk. Um, <laughs> what parallels do you see between the other movements and the LGBTQ movement? Uh, you know, and especially if you, if you um, identify or know anyone who identifies as, as in the dis disability community, what parallels do you see and what do you think we can all learn from each other? I am a strong proponent of intersectionality. And so I think Amen. it is always that we are stronger together. Um, I recently watched a video um, about a discourse between some Black um, individuals. And something that I found interesting that was brought up by some Black cis men um, was that they felt that when um, other Black people who were part of other marginalized groups brought up their own identity and how it wasn't being addressed in the wider movement for Black liberation and civil rights, that they believed that it lessened the movement. And that was very triggering to me <laughs> because it is not, that is just not the reality. First and foremost, we know that um, queer people of color were at the, the, the front of both the civil rights movement and the, the LGBTQ rights movement. And I think, it's so important that we are all, you know, striving together. Um, when we were meeting to talk about this discussion, this panel discussion, Anthony mentioned that BPI is one of the only um, organizations in the world that talks about the intersectionality of blindness and um, queerness. And that was sort of concerning to me in a way, um, because I'm very grateful and happy that BPI exists. But I'm also, it's concerning to me that more has not come about because I think being disabled, Steph says this all the time, anyone can become disabled at any point in their life. And I think it is a, a great struggle being um, both sometimes. There are homophobic people in the disabled community and there are ableist people in the queer community. Yeah. So I think we really just need to be working on bridging the gaps because adding quote unquote more people to the, the fight for liberation and this great activist um, journey that we're on is not gonna lessen the movement, it's only gonna strengthen it. And to your point, um, we're the only for blind low vision, but we're one of the only disabled LGBTQ um, organizations period. So we have members who are, you know, um, hard, deaf and hard, deaf or hard of hearing. We have members in wheelchairs. We have um, um, cystic fibrosis. We, we have a lot of non low or no vision LGBTQ folks, and we have a ton of allies that are either sighted and LGBTQ or straight and whatever um, that, want to, that want to support this intersectionality. So thank you for, for pointing that out. Marta. Uh, um, so I think over time, the awareness of pride has gotten better uh for sure like my personal opinion is like whatever makes you happy like if you're not hurting hurting some like injuring someone or hardening yourself in the process like go for it like live your life girl uh, uh you know <laughs> like life is short like 
be be who you want to be. But I honestly don't think there's enough groups for the pride community like in the disabled community that's like equally spread out yeah which is kind of sad um as far as like resources brothers and sisters because you know it's so it's so hard a life just just to live and then even in, and Ryan, I'm sure you've encountered this, even in the LGBTQ community, there's still a huge stigma to our trans brothers and sisters from us. And that, that bothers me to the core. How about you, Christine? Um, yeah, I agree with Marta and Ryan. Um, intersectionality is very important for any movement um but also we have to talk about resiliency because both groups go through it every day we have yeah. our struggles but another thing i want to talk about is gatekeeping and um it's you know i've seen it more in the disability community than the yeah. lgbt community it's like you know <laughs> in my high school um you know some people would fight about who's more blind than who who can't see yeah than who and it's like at the end of the day it's ridiculous if you have a disability you have a disability if you're part of the lgbtq plus movement you're part of the movement whether you're an ally or not you know putting all of these criteria to legitimize or delegitimize a person's struggles or identity is just ridiculous um and it's just a way to divide everybody and break down the movements Good, good, good point. I think that's probably going to end up being the genesis, you know, the movement uh, or the moving in the movements going forward. You know, light skin, dark skin is another huge one, you know, and mm -hmm. we're going to have to mm -hmm. gotta battle those within us as we battle what's against us or what's opposing us. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's going to be a huge piece of the, of a lot of the movements going forward, getting rid of the gatekeeping. That was an, that was an excellent point, Christine. I mean, like kudos. Thanks. How about you, Steph? You know, when you ask about parallels, the first thing that popped into my head was shame um, within the, the different movements. Um, because I think shame is so powerful and it keeps us it can keep us from, you know, being our, our best selves and shame, you know, if, if we're afraid to, to be our true authentic selves because we're, we're filled with shame. Um, oh yes, yeah, Stephanie, you don't want to be see, that loud blind lady. Oh no. <laughs> you see, no, you see where I'm going though. With the, the parallels between the disability community, um, the LGBTQ community, um, even um, within the Black community, and like Christine had mentioned with the gatekeeping and stuff and the, the different shades of color and all of those different things which can be used to distract us, sometimes shame can be the barrier that prevents us from being... Um, our, our best selves and, and especially I think with within a movement, um, not being able to um, put forward who you really are um, or voice, you know, <laughs> sh show your voice because of shame. Um, those things can prevent us from, you know, moving forward. Um, but I think you know, we're, we're headed in the right direction. We still have a long way to go. And I do want to add, um, I think among this, this conversation right here on this panel, so much great insight was being brought forward. I'm just so thankful to be part of it. So that's my two cents. Nazarene, you got four or five for us? <laughs> <laughs> I might. <laughs> I'm always hustling, baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. 
Um, I gotta, well, I can just definitely say this. Um, as a heterosexual, you know, female, I really feel looking at, and who is, who is visually impaired as well, um, looking at the LGBT community as a whole, where it is evolved to today, is a far, you know, is huge milestones and steps where they come. What I love about the community in its essence is the fact that they are numbers so strong and so deep and wide. And they, you know, they are always congregating together and helping one another uplift. Um, and I love that about the community. They are so strong and they're so powerful uh, within within our, our, you know, our cities and our societies. And it took them a long time to get there. And it's great to see that. Add that with the blindness. I think that's where, you know, like Steph was talking about shame, but I'm also, I'm, uh, that's one side of the coin, but I'm also going to say acceptance because I think the LGBT community has come to a point where they're very comfortable in their skin. They're accepting themselves. So the intersection for yeah. them, they're kind of driving the intersection, That what I yep. feel. And then I feel that on top of that, then what, they, what they're starting to do or should do, because you mentioned that, um, you know, just blindness community within the LGBT community or the other disability community, period, as Mara said, is so strong, is so small in numbers that it's, it would be great to see if the, the LGBT community could kind of bring them into the fold, into their bosoms and, and sort of help uplift them too. Because like I think somebody in this panel said, we don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow. Today, you may not be disabled, but you could be LGBTQ. And tomorrow you could have another stigma attached to like like a, a like a blindness or could lose a, hearing that stigma attached to it. And then that's another sort of like um, acceptance and sort of, you know, you have to accept that and then also go through the whole shame feeling and scenario of that to get to acceptance. And it would be great to see more of the LGTB community kind of just, you know, reach out and help their brothers and sisters because, you know, as humans, even in the heterosexual uh, community, you know, we are, Today, we, there may be somebody who's not blind or, or deaf or, or you know, in a wheelchair, but tomorrow there could be. So I think as human beings, um, we can only feel, we try to feel each other's pain as much as we can. But I think the essence of feeling each other's pain is more when we're part of a community and a movement or, and we have passion to believe in that. So I really think the intersection fold needs to, you know, the LGBT community, as strong as they are, and powerful as they are, should definitely try to uplift and bring the bring this community to to a, a greater level and to part of the movement that has not probably been um, a, a showcase so far, uh, I believe, and and allow that door to open for for these people who are, I guess, in that intersection because they're not only dealing with the blindness but they're dealing with you know um, being part of that community. They want to be part of that community and more representation. Um, and, and give them that, that more empowerment. So that's what I feel coming from my perspective. I cannot imagine you know, uh, being, um, I can only imagine being blind and being heterosexual, but I cannot be, imagine being blind and being um, part of the, you know, being a uh, lesbian or gay or, or anything else in, in, that, in, that, in, those, in those letters. I can't imagine that um, because I'm not part of that. So we all have to be sensitive and we all have to bring everyone together. I think that's, and I think seeing the LGBT community come, uh, you know, push through AIDS in that era and get to where they are today. And, you know, part of a large movement in corporate, in other, you know, in businesses, uh, you know, holding their own. And, and you see those numbers and groves when pride happens, wherever pride parades happen, wherever you, month it is for you, wherever you are. For us here in Toronto, it's always in June, but I know in other places, just July, et cetera. Um, and so it's good to see like them coming out in millions, you know, to come out and support one another. So why not support people with disabilities and bring them up too? So I think that should be the next part of the movement if it's not already been done so. Absolutely. If I could respond to that. I'm sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> Go ahead. I just really want to echo that sentiment, Nesreen. I think especially today, um, it's so important that if someone has a platform, if someone has privilege, you have to be, you have a responsibility and an obligation to use that to clear the space and make space for people who don't have that platform. Um, I think my generation talks about this a lot, especially with like influencers. Um, you know, yeah. if you have 3 million, 8 million followers, you should be using that for good. You shouldn't just be using that to get brand deals or make money or get validation there are people who need to be seen and need to be heard. And 
um, it could be the opportunity of having your platform um, that can cause them to get more visibility and get more representation and people will become more empathetic towards them. We talked about representation in media and things. That is so important because I feel that social media today is just a great opportunity to clear space and um, bring people into movements today. Um, because one example is last year or maybe in 2019, I thought that people could only go by one set of pronouns, like either he, him, his, or they, them, theirs, stuff like that. You know, I, and then through social media, through influencers mm -hmm. speaking about their experiences or people sharing other people's experiences on their social media, I learned, okay, you can go by he, they, or you can go by several different pronouns. And it can, it's a great opportunity for people to learn um, and also it's just a great opportunity for us to just take care of each other. We have to be more compassionate, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well you know, folks, it's a double-edged sword and I want to comment on both sides of it. A couple of years ago, Kevin Hart, who is hilariously funny, you know, intelligent, et cetera, um, got himself into some, got himself into quite a bit of trouble making statements and using his social media um, to, to affirm attitudes that weren't necessarily friendly to the LGBTQ community, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and by extension, some of the remarks that he could also be taglined to, to disabled folks. And um, there was a huge backlash and you don't see the level of, um, uh, you, you know, of access to him. You don't see people buying into his brand the way they once did. Uh, I think he's slowly coming back. He's apologized and, and done some sensitivity training. And I believe that anybody and everybody should have the opportunity to rectify their mistakes. But on the opposite end of that spectrum, there was a, a video that went viral. And if you look it up, it's um, Drag Queen Reads Black Lives Matter Protester. And at one point in a video, you see this guy turn around to a bunch of clearly LGBTQ, they're wearing their shirts and, and rainbow stuff, um, you know, and he says, you don't belong here, this is not your fight. Well, you don't tell a drag queen anything about what is or isn't your fight. And she reads him to the core, you know, telling, you know, and she pointedly, baby boy, boo, let me tell you about fighting. And, you know, and she goes on to say she's almost 60 years old and what she had to go through and how everything that anybody has to go through only adds rather than detracts from a movement. And that's a really powerful statement to make. And I think we all need to be looking at all of us who are ableized, who are marginalized, who are put on the other shelf. And instead of, well, this isn't as bad as this, or you don't understand this struggle, it doesn't matter. I understand struggle. I struggle every day. And if we struggle together, our chorus is going to be a heck of a lot louder than that, you know, three little piece ensemble over there. <laughs> so I guess it's time to ask if anybody has any closing thoughts that they want to. I hope we get a chance to do another conversation like this sometime soon. I, I feel if my balloon is beyond the stratosphere. <laughs> I'm close to the moon right now. But um, who else has any closing thoughts? I would just like to say, I think this has been a really, um, this has necessarily been a really amazing conversation. I, I just love the different viewpoints from the different age groups that we have here, from our interns to Steph, myself, and you, Anthony, uh, and just sharing our insights and learning. And also the back history of what perhaps, you know, Steph, and I had to kind of like, you know, go through uh, and, and what the world was like back then. I mean, you know, there was an acceptance level of this particular, you know, being gay or being lesbian, what that was like. I hope that helps people understand sort of where this sort of started so that we all can understand the movement and how they had to push through to where they are today. And so I, Amen. Love, <laughs> I love the insights and I'm hoping people will get a you know better perspective and picture of that. And I also have to say, you know, I'm, I'm very happy that these conversations are happening, especially also thrown in the fact of the pronouns and things. I think that is a great educational lifter for those out there who were not aware of that outside of the recruiting and sourcing industry. And, 
And so I think that for, for me, that, that has been, you know, a great, a great thing. It made me think actually of, um, you know, when I was born, uh, you know, who am I, what, what, what did I, what did I want to be and who I'm today? Where am I going to go tomorrow as, as, as far as gender identity go? Do I want to still remain in um, my cisgender group or do I want to go out of my, what's my comfort zone? Where, where do I want to be? Or what appeals to me? Like, like Christine said, what's her comfort zone? What is, uh, what, what is she? And I, and I, and that's something that is, you know, that helped me kind of identify, you know, who I still am and who I still want to be. Um, but it also gave me through this conversation more appreciation of hearing about Anthony, you know, your viewpoints um, and some of the struggles you've had to go through uh, in the community to get to where it is today. So I hope through your movement, Anthony, um, and your participation in, in this, that you'll be able to, to get more people who are blind and disabled visually impaired with disabilities, more integrated into the LGBT community uh, and push that forward. So the next conversation we may have may not be about intersection, but maybe about as, uh, as a different community as, as a whole, what is the LGBT community as a whole doing now? What are, what are they up to now? And not this sort of small pockets, um, whether it's the trans pocket that you're trying to, with more acceptance or the disability pocket that you're trying to weave into the fabric. Uh, and I'd certainly like to explore the balloon more. <laughs> That's a new one for me. <laughs> you know what I tell folks, you know, when they, when they talk about disability or LGBTQ, especially transgender, um, and, I, and I usually bring it to transgender, I say, you know, imagine while you were still in, in your mom's belly and, and things were progressing along in the brain and the organs or whatever. And, and she decided that one day she wanted that jalapeno pepper. But unfortunately that ticked the little something. And instead of, you know, instead of the organ that matches the brain, now you got the opposite organ all because of that jalapeno pepper. But you're gonna have to live an entire life knowing that your brain is one thing and your body is another through no fault, no fault of your own. How would you feel? And if you think about that long enough, you'll come to a place of acceptance. And you can substitute disability, LGBTQ, race, gender, you can substitute all of the ableisms into that one statement and, and force somebody to think about it. All your mom had to do was eat a jalapeno pepper and you might be in the same damn situation. <laughs> I know science doesn't support that, but it's, you know, we can accept people coming back from the dead on soap operas. We can play around a little bit yeah, with the Halloween. Yeah, we can blame it on the peppers. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> that is such a great point, Anthony. I think empathy is one of the most powerful, powerful tools Donnie. that we can use for, for activism. I mean... I don't, sometimes I don't think people understand the amount of shame and the amount of fear that some of us go through on a daily basis. Sometimes the, the clothes that I choose to wear to express myself, I'm walking on the street in fear. Sometimes, well, and other times being a black man, I walk on the street in fear. And when you get people to understand that, it's gonna be uncomfortable. It's yeah. gonna be uncomfortable. As a man, I, I learn about the sexism that occurs around me in my own home, in my own community. It is uncomfortable for me because it challenges the, my identity and it challenges my, my view of the world. But it has to be done. You have to understand the amount of suffering that goes into being a part of any marginalized community and that's why it's so important to me to be having these um, stories told on television, in media, all across social media, because it allows us to be seen and it allows people to really begin to empathize with our stories. I agree with you, um, Ryan, ab about the empathy. I think we need more empathy and more compassion. Unfortunately, there's always going to be people that. Um, will not, or they just don't have the capacity to uh, be able to empathize. Um, with Bold Blind Beauty, it's always been my stance that um, those really aren't the people that we're talking to. Um, I believe that everybody has the capacity, as you said, Anthony, to change, to redeem themselves, all of that. I do. I do believe that. 
But um, there's a quote that I love that I live by, by Jackie Joyner Kersey that says, you know, if I stop to kick every barking dog, I'm not going to get to where I need to go. And yeah. that to me is so important with advocacy. You have to remain focused. You have to remember your why. You cannot change people. Only people themselves, the person themselves, can decide to make that change. Um, yeah. And if a person is open to wanting to change, to wanting to listen, then that's the person I want to talk to. I, I like to invite people in to um, listen to our stories, to try to understand who we are so that they can gain that empathy and thereby the compassion to, um, you know, perhaps understand and even um, become an ally and walk alongside with us. That's beautiful. And yes, it is about pick your battles because there are, there's always going to be a multitude of battles in front of you but not every one of them can you win and not every one of them should you even engage in because the, the strength of what you need and where you're going with the movement is much more important than the individual battle. Wow, this has been amazing. Um, if I can just tell folks, blindlgbtpride.org. We were formulated in the dark ages before uh, Q became added to the tagline. So if you'd like um, more information or you'd like to get in contact with us, it's blindlgbtpride.org. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you so much, Anthony.